Welcome to the Tapestry of Life on CCP TV, Community College of Philadelphia, three time Emmy nominated educational channel. I am Dr. Pascal Scholes, Professor of Behavioral Health and Human Services, and Director of the Office of Collegiate Recovery at Community College of Philadelphia. Today's topic is the opioid epidemic in Philadelphia. As many of you know, drug overdose deaths in Philadelphia surged to over 900 in 2016. The over 900 deaths in the city last year was more than triple the number of homicides. The overdose surge is a 30% increase in a single year. To discuss the topic from a personal perspective, I want to welcome back my co-host, Dr. Renee Dar Norris Jones, who recently received her PhD. And if you know from other uh, shows that I've done with Renee, she was Ms. Jones at that time. And uh, our special guests are Elvis Rosado, uh, a former graduate of Community College of Philadelphia's Behavioral Health Program, and also a very well known a person from Prevention Point. Uh, and Yvette Kamira Jones, is that close? Close enough? Okay. Uh, from the Department of Behavioral Health and Intellectual Disabilities, and we've worked with Yvette over the years, and she's been just a, a wonderful supportive person around the City College, and she's actually taking some courses right now at Community College of Philadelphia. Well, it's, uh, it's always nice to uh, welcome uh, both of you, since I know both of you for quite a few years, it feels like a homecoming, and I know you, you had been on one show once before. And uh, Elvis was, a, I advised Elvis for many, many years in the early 90s. And Elvis has become, uh, 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 recently an article was uh, about you, and uh, you were kind of known as the Lazarus person. And by that I mean, uh, he had, how many people have you saved with Narcan? About uh, to date 20? now is uh, 39 people. 39 people. Yeah. It's wonderful, Elvis. Why don't you tell us a little bit about uh, what you do? Um, I'm currently the coordinator of education and outreach for Prevention Point Philadelphia. And um, I was actually doing three separate programs. I do all of the Narcan training and overdose education for the city of Philadelphia and surrounding counties. And I do a program called Latino Teach in collaboration with Philadelphia Fight which is an HIV education program for individuals that are HIV positive who speak little to no English at all. And it covers everything from HIV 101 all the way through how to understand and read their labs and, and whatnot. And I also do, uh, men I teach in a mentoring program um, for individuals, it's two, two different uh, individuals, uh, individuals that are still actively using who are having a tough time getting over that hump into treatment and what to expect and all that's going to happen in their process. And I do another piece for individuals that are in their early stages of treatment. And we discuss everything, um, really, I, I call it their what do I do now stage and what to do from that point on. And one of the main classes that I teach is separating themselves from the relationship they have with, the, with addiction. So it's a grief and loss class, but it's not grief and loss of people, it's grief and loss of the chemical itself and learning how to separate that relationship. Mm -hmm. And, and, and I'm, I'm sorry, can you just tell us a little bit more about Prevention Point, Point for folks who don't know what that is? So yeah. Prevention Point Philadelphia originally started as a needle exchange program in 1992. I've been involved with them since 92, so I, this year we celebrate 25 years. We started as a needle exchange program because injection drug users were getting infected at a rate of 48 point, I believe it's 48.8% were getting infected with HIV. 50% were getting hepatitis uh, B. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I remember since that. Then, remember since then, that. yeah, since then to now, <laughs> as a result of needle exchange, uh, HIV transmission is down to 5%. Wow. Hepatitis B is down 80%. Um, we are officially the only needle exchange in the country that has an HIV clinic attached to it. We do free medical twice a week in-house and twice a week on the mobile units. We feed the homeless and anybody in the community who doesn't have food can come in and eat at our kitchen. We have a homeless shelter. We have a Suboxone program, Vivitrol program. You want to tell them a little bit what that means? Because much of our well, audience might not know. Suboxone it. is a medication used for individuals who are coming off of opiates. It is a combination of an opiate and Suboxone, I mean, and uh, Narcan mixed that one blocks the urges and the other one is um, 
helps them get, helps them get off through detox, the, kind through, of. Yeah, to get off. And then the Vivitrol, which is the name of the company here in Philadelphia, the chemical is actually naltrexone, which is a 28, there it comes in two forms. It comes in a tablet you can take daily, or it comes in a 28-day injection that blocks the individual for 28 days so that they don't feel any, any effects of the opiate itself. So, and this an opiate is, is that prescription drugs? Is that just street? It's, it it's street drugs. It could be street drugs. It could be prescription drugs. It could be methadone, a combination of things. Okay. Mm -hmm. So any opiate whatsoever would be blocked. Even for at least a semi-synthetic will block. Yes. Yeah, which would be methadone and, and okay. others. Yeah. Um, so, but and yeah. that movement, that that <laughs> discussion you just gave, is really the, where the field kind of is kind of moving. We don't even call them methadone programs. No, anymore. and that's what I'm used to hearing uh, over the decades. Is we <laughs> call them what do they call medicaid? Med yeah, med uh, MAT. Yeah, medically, MAT. medically assisted treatment is treatment. what it's called mm -hmm. now, okay. and that includes all of that, whether it's methadone, suboxone, yeah. Vivitrol. Part of that was because yeah. of the stigma of methadone, you know, and, yeah, you know, and, and at least the other one has more of a kind of physician medical feel okay. you, yeah would you say yeah because like suboxone is something that docs have to get a separate licensure or or addition to their license to be able to prescribe but something like vivitrol because vivitrol what it is is basically narcan at a higher concentrated level okay um there is no it's not a controlled substance so anybody who can write a prescription and anybody who can administer an injection can actually prescribe it in and give it to a patient. It's just advocating through the insurance company for the fact that the person needs the Vivitrol. Yeah. Now, no uh, uh, I don't know, but I mean, when I think back on the commission, you know, the mayor's commission, I'm on the Drug and Alcohol Commission, that probably over the last six or seven years, there's been this increased movement away from methadone and into, you know, this medically assisted kind of activity. Now, I know you do a lot of work in the community. Absolutely. So I'm actually, I, I actually work at the Consumer Satisfaction Team, and I've been there a little over 11 years, and we do, we're contracted by the Department of Behavioral Health okay. to do quality assurance. So we go out into the field and we talk to individuals who receive services, and that includes medication-assisted treatment. And traditionally, those programs were called uh, methadone maintenance, mm -hmm. the service type, and now more and more they're transitioning into medication assisted because they're starting to offer naltrexone and suboxone. Mm -hmm. And um, it, again, it takes away the stigma. Yeah. 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 So the, the, the movement towards a, a non-stigmatized kind of almost like a physician feel mm -hmm. to methadone uh, and the movement into the areas that we're talking mm -hmm. about is really to offset some of that stigma <clears> of like, you know, the nodding out, the uh, heroin addict, uh, you know. I used to run a methadone program at 12th and Walnut when it was at 12th and Walnut, the old AMHA one. And the problem that we always had is that they would leave the clinic and then everyone knew that they were on methadone. Right. So I'm going to play devil's advocate a little bit because you all three are in the same industry. Mm -hmm. And I heard you say that it takes the stigma away from someone outside of that community. I don't well, it's see attempting that. to take the stigma okay. away. Okay, from it's someone attempting. that's not in the field, I don't see it being removed. I mean, from my perspective, and it might be a little archaic, but I, an addict is an addict is an addict. Whether, and then you have recovery. So you basically see addict and then you see recovery. So is that what's changed in mm -hmm. the field? And is that maybe, well, does that and, change and, uh, maybe you know, make a way for I, what Elvis does? I, I think all of us would agree that we're always an addict. We're just in recovery. But we always are in the process of trying to make our lives better. I okay. Mean, I, I yeah. don't think. Absolutely. And excuse so, my ignorance there. I'm just looking yeah. from the outside, yeah. looking in, saying I, I still see, and my first husband was an addict. Yeah. Um, addict and then recovery, like the two. And I'm not sure well, how see, much there, there of is, the outside is, folks, and, and other it's an it's an folks go that way. Discussion. There is a group within the field that doesn't consider the MAT programs to be recovery oriented. Mm -hmm. uh, as you know, we've done and a MAT few shows, is, mm -hmm. medically assisted treatment. Okay. Um, and, and the field has struggled uh, because of its historical relationship to AA and NA. Okay. And there was a group which we used to say, you can't go to recovery meeting because you're on methadone. And we had, to, or, or, if you remember, originally, we used to set up methadone recovery meetings wow. yeah. where people would come only because within the recovery community, and it still exists, that stigma, I, I suspect, they would say, well, you're not in recovery because you're still using drugs. But if, 
if someone was a diabetic and was taking X, mm -hmm. you wouldn't say, hey, you, you can't come to a recovery group on, you know, on, for medical reasons, you know, or something like that. So it is a process that we're still involved in. And the, the traditional people, uh, mainly the AA people more than the NA people, and I say this based on my own personal experience of different meetings that I've gone to, is that they still harbor a little uh, suspicion uh, would you say? What do you, what do you think? Can I, can I just Go speak ahead, on yes. that? I recently visited uh, an MET program and uh, they switched their service type around from met just methadone and traditional DNA, IOP, and they combined the two, okay? And they're now going to begin offering 12-step meetings there. Yeah. For everybody. For everybody. For everybody. And you're absolutely right about that. that the, sti the, the stigma, yeah. yeah, because when I go to meetings, I experience the same thing. But like you said, a person in recovery is a person in recovery. Yeah. You know? one, of the, one of the reasons that we started the mentoring program was because there were individuals that were actively using or in their early stage of treatment who felt like they wanted to be able to go to a meeting or a group and have a conversation about what they would do but didn't feel that they could go to your traditional 12-step program because they were going to be judged or, well, mm -hmm. you know, some people felt that it was a waste of time and it's like, can I do something different? So one of the reasons, and I, and I do the, the two pieces because obviously with somebody who's, who's still actively using, part of it is, you know, what's going to happen to me? What's all, because realistically we know that, you know, Throwing some numbers out, Philadelphia has between 55 to 60,000 injection drug users mm -hmm. in Philadelphia. That's not counting the ones that are chewing and snorting and everything else. These are shooters. These are just injection drug yeah. users. You know, and we have currently 7,000 treatment slots in the city of Philadelphia. We have 60 detox beds, some extra ones here and there, depending on who they are. City has some, you know, special favors and whatnot. Um, but... What happens is that somebody presents, you know, you see people who say, and this is part of the stigma, you don't get help because you don't want it. You know, but somebody presents to a, a facility that gets an assessment done and they sit there for eight hours and they're told, well, you know what, we don't have a bed, come back tomorrow. And come back tomorrow and come back tomorrow and come back tomorrow. So they're getting high and high and high. And during that time period, they're getting high, we put some, put some at risk of overdose, but during that, they, a lot of people don't know that. They think that when they present somewhere, that there's going to be this little magic wand that's going to be waved and they're going to go straight into treatment. So part of that education piece is letting them know, look, you're probably going to present somewhere, sit there for eight hours, and they're going to tell you, we can't take you, we don't have a bed for you. Um, the issue of IDs and the fact that if your license, if you have a Philadelphia driver's license and it expired yesterday, you can't use it to get into treatment today. It's, val it's not valid anymore. You have to have a license to get into you have treatment. You have to have a valid ID. 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 And, yeah. and and but if it expired yesterday, you can't use, you can't it. use it. They don't accept it. I, I'm still <coughs> on that you have to have ID. Yeah, you do. So how many people well, that service. are strung out on whatever, it, it this, and this even, is, or homeless, have... And this is my point. And this is why I do that mentoring project right. with people that are still actively using. The, because they're expected in their, in their withdrawal, in their active addiction, to hustle up $30 because welfare doesn't give you cash anymore. Right. You have to hustle up $30, transportation, jump on a train, go to 8th and Arch. You have to establish residency? Yeah, you have to have, a, <laughs> a, you have, to have a, uh, an address. We, at Prevention Point Left, we use our address as a mailing address. But when you get to the door of, of Penda on 8th and, 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 and Arch, there is a sign that says minimum two-hour wait. So you have somebody who is sick, who had to hustle $30 and transportation, who now has to sit there for three hours to get an ID to present to a facility that may say, we're sorry, we don't have yeah. a bed for you. Come back tomorrow. I don't know if they still allow it. You would know, because I haven't done it, because you know, when I it was quite a few years ago. We used to have to send to the Philadelphia Library and get a library card. To just yeah, they don't accept that. They anymore. don't accept that any longer. But at one time, we used to say, well, go get a library card, bring the library card back with your ID, and that way we can get you started. Yeah. Because, and I think, if I'm not mistaken, the gurney, the, all the stuff that's going on right now in the Kensington area, I think only about 80% of them are on Medicaid. Less than that. Less than that. And, 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 but what happens is that you have somebody... They're uninsured. If, if you've had a Philadelphia ID before, if you've had a Philadelphia address with an ID in Philadelphia before, you can present with your money order and say, I'm already in the system, and that works. But if you're new to the city, if you're from one of the counties, you have to present with Social Security card, birth certificate, yeah. ID, proof of address, money order... To get in one. To get an ID. I, 
to um, get the ID. Just to then try I, I to just, get treatment. I just have a one word question. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Why? <laughs> Why? Well, that is the, the, the $65,000 question, that's, as they right. say. I mean, I, I'm, I'm listening to this from a survivor. I'm a survivor yeah, of sure. domestic violence. Yeah. And when you said that there's no beds, folks ask me all the time, well, why, don't, why doesn't she just leave? You know, there's shelters yeah, out sure. there. I know what it's like. You have to have opportunity and courage and yeah. determination to yeah. be able to say, I'm going to go do this. So I know what it's like back when I went through it in the 70s to go out to a payphone, to leave my house, sure. hopefully he didn't know that I left, to go to a payphone for them to say there's no space. Mm -hmm. yeah. So the next time that I think I have the courage and the opportunity to do this, I might go, oh, they're Why not going to have any space well, actually, you when, know, I'm not yeah, going to do and it. I, and I'll defer to both of you who have more recent experience than I do. One of the problems that we had in Kensington at the Kensington Clinic when I was working there was that it's so frustrating to get on that we were precipitating, we believe, more addiction and relapse yeah. by the, just the waiting and nothing happening, and then they would and go back, lost, back out it, on it, the street. And they've already lost hope. It takes a lot of hope to go through. Yeah, just to walk through the door. Walk through that door, and then you're giving me this list of things to do. I'm going back and get high. Yeah. And, but look, here's, here's a prime example. I, a couple comes in. They're both trying to get into treatment. They have never been in treatment in, in Philadelphia before which is ideal because usually they get in right away. They went on a Wednesday. They got an assessment. They sat there for eight hours. They called me at 8.30 at night and said, we were told to leave because there's no beds. They came back Thursday. They came back Friday. Saturday mm -hmm. morning, he got into Eagleville. She got into Girard. Sunday, he had already been discharged. Monday, she got discharged because the insurance is only covering co two and cover. three days. You know, you might as well have put them in a hotel room because all, all they did was sleep, sure. get a little bit of rest, and they were out again. They disappeared for about a month and a half, and I thought I was going to get that call. You know, the call that I got was, Mr., you ain't going to, I'm not even going to ask you to guess where we're at because you'll never guess, but we're in Maine. Oh, okay. And they said, you're where? And they said, we found a detox in Maine that would take us for 30 days, no questions asked, so we're out here. Now that adds, I mean, I don't know, and, and again, I, I, I'll, I'll go to my ignorance because I haven't been in the, that area for quite a while. Do they still have difficulties with people coming from other states? Like, remember, we used yeah. to get a large group from Delaware. Yeah, if they used you, to send them up coming, to us. And how about Puerto Rico? Remember, well, we used to send, they used to come into Philadelphia. They, they still did until recently, uh, until oh, okay. the storm hit. Until the storm hit. But that's the, the air bridge. The and air that bridge. population was even more What's difficult. <laughs> so the air bridge was you had a group of recovery houses that started going to Puerto Rico in early 2000 would convince family members and community members to send their, their drug-addicted individuals to Philadelphia that they were going to provide them treatment. And they had this video that they would show with this beautiful house with swimming pools and picket fence. Yeah. And they even promised Already them horseback riding. To get them out of Puerto Rico. They would get here. <laughs> they'd end up in Kensington, 40 in a, a three-bedroom house. They would take their credentials, birth certificate, everything from them because we need to hold it. They put them on, to, on welfare, and the minute that there was the slightest infraction, they would kick them to the street. Those documents got sold from anywhere from $1,500 to $2,000. By the, the person is now on the street, they would end up under the bridge at Gurney. By the time that person got a hold of somebody who said, we have mm -hmm. somebody who can help you, it'd be a month or two. And they didn't have any ID. They didn't have any ID, so they're, they're, sold they're undocumented Puerto Ricans mm -hmm. in Philadelphia, even though they're citizens, um, who don't trust the system. They hit well. They finally get in. If somebody says, "Let's take you to welfare," welfare runs them through and said, "I'm sorry, we can't give you an ID or help you, because it's coming up that you're working in Jersey or Chicago or Someone Maryland." Who they sold the idea. Somebody who, whoever bought the idea is now using it to mm. work somewhere else, and this was constant. So now you have a couple of hundred people from the town that I'm from in Puerto Rico. There were 57 people in Philadelphia. Mind you, this is happening in Philadelphia, New York, Boston, Florida. And um, in New York, did I say New York? No. Yeah, in New York. You know, Chicago had a huge problem. They did a huge documentary on the amount of Puerto Ricans on the streets of Chicago undocumented as a result of the air bridge. What they would do then is they were still sending bills to the family. Your, your, your loved one still does, can't afford to pay this month's rent. You need to send money. And some mayors were paying for the person to come here and everything else, and they didn't realize this was happening. At one point, people start to find out. We did actually, we went to Puerto Rico and started talking to mayors about what was happening. They stopped, and these people then went to the next town. What ends up happening is that after a while, the police department and some of the mayors said, wait, 
this may be good for, for business. So then they would pick you up and they would say, Pat, you have a choice. We take you to jail, we put you on a plane and send you to the United States for treatment. So you're going to the United States? I'll go to the United States for treatment. They would call that, the recovery house would pick that person up at the airport. And then the, the governor was, or the mayor was paying to send the person over here. But all of them ended up stranded on the streets of Philadelphia and, and the other four states. And therefore states. contributing to the gurney. Da, da, yeah, da, da, to the da, drug da, da, abuse. Da. But they couldn't get Medicaid. They couldn't get any type of help because they're stuck on the streets. Right. And there was a 90-day rule, I remember, or something like that. Yeah. And some of them ended up getting infected with HIV, with hepatitis. Some of them committed crimes. By the time we established, you know, we got a hold of them and said, let's call your family and see if we can get you back. They're now on probation and can't leave. Yeah. So now they have no insurance, no income. They're on probation and can't leave because they're stuck. They have to report. And they can't get into the programs because they don't have ID. Because they don't have ID. Right. And they don't have insurance. Now, that, now so that's, this, this is the first time I'll, I'll bet you heard this. <coughs> right? it's the very first time, uh, and I'm going. And how many people don't hear this story and just blame? You have the, addiction. You have folks yeah. that are addicted and folks yes. in recovery. There's yes. No, no, yeah. there's no. no. A lot of it has to do with the way the system's really organized against. Yeah. Uh, groups of people coming in. We never had a free pass into the clinics. Never. And, I don't and remember. For my yeah. interpretation, and probably a lot of folks like me, you want help, you go to <laughs> no, AA, happen. you go to a system, and there's folks that's there to help yeah. you. And if you're not making it, if you're not in recovery, you don't want to be because that's not the life you want to leave. So yeah. you want to stay where you're at. Right. And usually what happens, and this is, and this is traditional where, you know, traditionally happens with individuals. You know, it's already difficult enough when you separate, because you have people who suffered trauma that brought them to addiction, and you have people that went into addiction that brought them through to traumas. And those individuals, once they get, they get themselves, you know, out of that, now have to deal with the, the reality that is life. As we say, life on life's terms. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's hard as it is. And if you don't have any tools, if you don't have anything, it becomes a struggle. And some people say, you know what? I'd rather be on the streets homeless using because I know what to expect every morning. I'm going to get up yeah, sick. I mean, that's a I'm going to have to thought. hustle than being here sober, dealing with the reality that I don't have an education, I don't have a job, I don't have a place to live. You know, and you might have a language and I don't barrier. Know, I may have a language barrier. And the reality is, I don't know what to expect every day. This is exactly why victims of domestic violence stay with their ass. Yeah. Because at least I know at 5 o'clock my husband's going yeah. to come in and bash my head in every yeah. Wednesday yeah. at 5 o'clock. I did Unknown some domestic violence there. work. And yeah. some women used to say to me, I'd rather get my behind beat once a week and have a home and somewhere to keep my kids than be in a shelter or be out there and not know where I'm going to end up. Right. And when I went through the shelter stay was maybe two weeks or a week. And I go, if you had to turn your life around, what are you going to do in a week? Yeah. Um, I, Dr. Scholes mentioned at the beginning that I just became, I just got my PhD. Um, that was an emotional journey for me because I made that promise to myself when I was, my husband was, he shot up drugs. Yeah. Abused me for seven years. Um, I finally escaped, but it wasn't for a woman against abuse who empowered me. I wouldn't have been sure. where I'm at. So it was that empowerment, the yeah. empowerment, not all of this that Yeah, but see, you had resources. Described. Yes. So you had, had resource. resources. So they empowered me. Even though I had to leave and I had to come back, mm -hmm. they never talked bad about me. If I decided I was going to go back and try this, all right, we're going to go back, let's do safety planning. But it was empowering me as an individual to go back and get this PhD. Yeah. But there's no empowerment here. No, no. Well, there's, well, there's, there's, there's there is some. There is some, but this is, and this is something but that I tell people. it doesn't seem like it's yeah. the model. So well, it's, it's like a it's fairly an negative environment, and to find the empowerment is complicated. Right. You know, I think that one of the things we have to, we have to keep in mind is that every one of us plays a part. We either play a part in helping or we play a part in the hindrance. And, you know, we don't realize sometimes that I may not be able to get that person into treatment today, but it doesn't mean that I can't take the time to talk to that person, have a moment with them, and treat them like, and remind them that they're a human being. Mm -hmm. So look. And we remember uh, those things. We yeah. all remember and this is, and I'll tell those you, Elvis, things. On the other side, <laughs> as a therapist type counselor, it's very frustrating when you see someone in front of you and you know you can help them and you can't get them into the system because of yeah. these blockages. Yeah. Well, you know. But I, like for instance, I had an episode, uh, an incident on, on American and Lehigh. I'm coming out of the, I'm going into the pharmacy. No, I was on my way out, and the young lady stops me and asks me, and I'll clean it up, but she says, basically, can I give you a sexual favor for $5? Mm -hmm. And I said, no. 
I said, but I'll give you the five dollars if you let me give you a hug. And she looked at me and goes, why would you want to hug me? Look at me. I'm dirty and I smell and blah, blah, blah. And, and I said, but you're still a human being. Yeah. So she came over. I gave her a hug. She started crying. I gave her the five dollars. And I walk away and she walks past me and she's crying and she goes, you know what? I may stink and I may be a drug addict, but I feel like a woman right now. I feel like a woman because oh, you mm -hmm. treated me like a human being. She just walked past me and she was like, that. look, I'm holding my head up high today. I don't care what I look like. And, yeah, and this is what it's about. Yeah, Sometimes just reminding people that they're human beings. That's the empowerment that I yes. have. That's the it, empowerment. It, it carries See, you through. had some of that because your life experiences. Right. But a lot of people on the street, they... It's very difficult to find and, and, that. And, it's, and even the empowerment that I have does not mean that I spent years getting my stomach pumped because I was yeah. trying to commit suicide. Mm -hmm. That my self-esteem was, was tanked. I thought yeah. my life was over. Um, but it was the empowerment. It was that hug yeah. that you can go back to. You have to have a reference point somewhere along the way, that thing that you can grab on. And it makes me think, I know that you're in recovery. Recovery, you were also in recovery. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. What was the piece that helped you make that transition it was that empowerment it was the support it was being treated like with dignity and respect um, it was the fact that somebody believed in me when I didn't believe in myself yeah I think I think it may be different for men and women in some cases mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. for me it was the fact that I woke up in a I had made a promise well in, in a nutshell my father got me high I was 11 years old I used till I was 27 years old and found myself in a prison cell but I had made a decision that the day I brought a child into the world, my life had to change because I didn't want to become my father. And after I got incarcerated, um, about a month or two later, I found out my son's mother was pregnant. And that was it. It was a done deal for me. Yeah. That was my, I felt like I have, you know, God or, or the universe was saying, okay, I'm going to call you bluff. You now have a child coming into the world. What are you mm -hmm. going to do? Are you going to be a parent or are you going to be your father? I, I think parenthood, actually parenthood was a little different for me. The fact yeah. that I, I found a woman that I wanted to spend the rest of my life with, and I knew I was going to have children, and I, and I remember saying, I you can't really do both. don't want them to grow up with a junkie. I mean, I mean, I hate, I mean that's what I said to myself. Yeah. Right, right. And, and even then, when I said that, it took me two years, because I, I used to do a lot of meth, quaaludes, you know, yeah. alcohol. I was mm -hmm. that, you know, like, yeah. it would keep me alive. And then I stopped all that. And for two years, I was just smoking weed and once in a while drinking, and I thought I was in recovery. Uh, and then I realized that, you know, I got to stop that too. But I think it was, for me, it was a life change. It wasn't so much going to the meetings, interestingly yeah. enough, although I did. But yeah. what was important to me is that my life took on a different reality. I had someone who wanted to have children with me, and I wanted to be a father, and I wanted to be the right father. You know, and I figured if I'm high, I'm not the, I'm not the right father because I've seen so many parents who are high and crazy. I mean, that one show we did on uh, Recovery High School, those two kids in that film had been uh, in a family of addiction and were drinking when they were eight, nine years old. Yeah. See, and, that's and you the said fear. something important there. You said, I thought I was in recovery. Yes. I think that that's critical. Um, I know someone who stopped drinking, like they would drink all the time, and then they switched to non alcoholic beer. And I'm looking and going, um, even though it doesn't have any alcohol, I'm st somehow I think you're, you're in denial here. Yeah, you well, know? people would still go to the bar and drink that non alcohol. They would go to the environment right. and really threaten their recovery. So you could go back to a bar and have dinner, but you can't do it in the first few years of your recovery because right. it's just too like, oh, yeah. oh, what's going on here? You know, it's too shaky. You might, yeah. We often say that somewhere between the second and the fifth year, you start to stabilize yourself. But in those first two years, you, you, it won't take much to tip you. Yeah. You know, even just to getting a, a couple extra bucks in your pocket. I, I remember people would put their hands in their pocket and have like a couple hundred dollars from selling something. And they would say, hmm, I'm getting high just holding the money. Because what did they do when they had money? Mm -hmm. They yeah. went out and bought, you know, whatever they bought. Am I right? I mean, this is, you know, so there's all those kind of triggers. It's, it's a weak analogy because it's nowhere as serious as drugs, but I stopped smoking January 23rd this year. Mm -hmm. 40 years. Good for you. Um, and I still crave a cigarette. One of the things my doctor said, she said, some people can stop smoking and occasionally have one. Um, and there's other people pff, right here. Yeah. I cannot. She said, get rid of every ashtray, matches, everything in the house. 
um, and I use it as a crutch through everything yeah. for 40 years. So it's not so much the smoking, it's the, it was the crutch. I still get the cravings. Well, the, I'll tell you something about that craving, and, and this is something that I think all of us could attest to. It stays around for a while, yeah. and that's why I say the two to five years. After a while, it doesn't enter your consciousness. It just is so much a part of your consciousness early in recovery, and when I say early, I mean like the first couple years, that you say, oh, I'm never going to get over this. It's never going to get better. I'm always going to be thinking in the back of my mind about, in your case, smoking cigarettes or whatever, and nicotine addiction. 40 pounds later, it's like I have to stop putting yeah. food in my mouth to substitute for... You know, the I, only time yeah. I think about it now is every once in a while, um, something will happen. A song will come up when Triggers, I used to yeah. get a trigger. Mm -hmm. And I realize that's what it is, and I just let it pass by now. But it doesn't stay around a long time. Or I see an event that... Uh, kicks associated, yeah. associates uh, uh, with it, but it doesn't stay around long. It it's goes funny. Fast. It's funny because I I, enjoy, I enjoyed cigars, and it's been close to a year now that I don't smoke cigars. And about a week ago, I was wasn't feeling one. I had this funny cough, and I had that almost like a smoker's cough. And I got up and I put on and I grabbed my keys and I put my shoes on and I got to my car and I was on my way to the store to go buy a cigar and I was like. I don't smoke anymore. Where yeah, am I yeah, going? Yeah. <laughs> but it was like this common response that when I had that cough, I would go, I would smoke. And it's just like autopilot. And I started laughing because I'm standing outside and I was like, wow. It was just like I had not quit yet. Let me, let me uh, bring it back to the uh, opioid because mm -hmm. in reality, one of the reasons we're talking about all this mm -hmm. other related information is to really help them get over this initial kind That's of... Right. Uh, uh, life experience mm -hmm. and remember remember the highest recidivism rate is among heroin addiction hmm. highest death rate is among heroin addiction yep. if you look at the uh, 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 heroin addictive population well 80 percent relapse constantly constantly so one of the ways we're trying to offset that 80 percent phenomena is through medicine in, in, in a sense. And at some point I remember over the last years that more high school kids and, or school kids instead of using marijuana were going straight to heroin because it was the cool and hip thing to mm -hmm. do. How many of those folks are... So SAMHSA, SAMHSA did a study... Um, Tell them what SAMHSA is because we, we know what SAMHSA, who is SAMHSA is, this they Substance do... Abuse and Mental Health Administration. Yes. Which is basically the, a, a large publishing group that provides us with a lot of technical information yes. from the federal government that actually is being cut back right now. Yeah. Okay. We they did a study. Political. They did a study in 2016 of the previous year of 2015. 15 million people from the ages of 12 and up had admitted to abusing opiates that year. In 2016, in one month, 6.3 million people between the ages of 12 and up had admitted to abusing opiates that month. Mm. This is, and these are some of the numbers that she was talking about earlier that are crazy numbers that are stuck in my head. The United States is only 5% of the world's population, but we consume 95% of the world's opiate. Mm. We are one of the leading reasons why the drug trade exists on the planet. Mm. Philadelphia by itself last year in 2016 consumed over 665,000 pounds of opiates, both street drugs and prescription mm -hmm. drugs. And that's just Philadelphia. That ain't got nothing to do with the counties mm -hmm. or the rest of the state. You know, we had 59,000 reported deaths last year in the United States as a result of opiates. 60% of them are from the ages of 16 to 26. Mm. But keep in mind that the federal government has stated that there has been a 24% <laughs> underreporting. Mm. So you have their actual, the actual estimated number for them right now is 64,000 people died last year. You have to keep in mind, there has been since 2010, <clears throat> when, when fentanyl came into the, into the mainstream and onto the streets, fentanyl is synthetic. It's not a pharmaceutical fentanyl, and fentanyl is an anesthesia. Since, the, since then to 2013, we had a 286% increase in overdose death. We had a 50% increase in opiate use and abuse among men. We had a 100% increase among women. We had a 109% increase among 15-year-olds to 25-year-olds. We had a 72% increase in, in retirees 62 and over. 
And among that population, we had an 11.5% increase in overdose death. So this is something that's across the board. It, sure. It's not, it doesn't care about it's color, true. money, education. Yeah, that's true. It's across the board. This is a good lead into, why don't you do a little distinction between the heroin and fentanyl, you know, that little chart that so, so we can get started on sure. some of the epidemics. Sure. So you have, you know, one of the problems that we had in this country was the introduction of oxys in early 2000. Unfortunately, some of the pharmaceutical companies had convinced the doctors that it was not addictive if it was properly administered and paid and, attention to. a time to. release capsule. That was <coughs> when it yes. changed. And then, the but it's release. easily crushable, easily snortable, easily injectable. Now, what happens is that by mid-2000, it's now on the streets. It gives competition to the heroin industry, which forces the heroin industry to bring up its purity. Mm -hmm. Around 2006, uh, fentanyl peeks its head out into the world and then disappears again. And from then to 2010, somebody, I guess, decided we can create a synthetic fentanyl in a lab and it's not pharmaceutical and it's a lot you know we can create our own don't have to figure out how to get it from the from the pharmaceutical industry that floods the country and that's where the overdose deaths skyrocket um, and the reason I mean it doesn't mean it, but and the reason for that is that the effective and the lethal dose for heroin is real close yes very close yes as opposed to something like drinking where you can maybe do a lot of drinking and not overdose it's yeah. in the front end of this that it becomes a serious problem yes. Because like if it's two and a half percent cut and it goes to two and three quarters, you're dead. Yeah. That's and how which, close it and this is. And this is one of the, the unfortunate things. Um, fentanyl is, is between, f pharmaceutical fentanyl is between 50 to 100 times stronger than heroin. Synthetic fentanyl is about 100 times stronger Think than heroin. That. Wow. The heroin that we have out, Philadelphia has some of the purest heroin in the country right now. 92 to 96 percent pure. You, that traditional image that we used to have of somebody shooting heroin in a dark room with a candle and a spoon being held, that doesn't happen anymore. Hmm. People are doing cold shots of heroin. The traditional cold cooker, shot. metal, cold shots. What's a cold shot? So the traditional cooker, metal cooker, a spoon was to heat up to separate the purity from the cut. And you're shooting up the purity. And you're shooting the purity. Wow. Because the it's so pure now, all they're doing is in any little plastic bottle cap or even in the bag, they just shoot some water in there, mix it up, draw it back up, and inject it. So it's one of the reasons why you have more people walking down the street now injecting in plain sight than hiding out somewhere because they don't need to have that whole ritual anymore. And here's how nuts it used <laughs> to get, and I don't mean to is that when they used to sell uh, Coke on the street, when that was the crisis in the 80s, the way they used to sell it to you was they used to say, oh, the cut's vitamin A. They, they would act like it was yeah. wow. like good shit. Yeah. I mean, am I right? I mean, <laughs> yeah. like, this is well, good stuff. It doesn't have like, that's, that's something that, that, that's that's something so, that I talk about yeah, because yeah. in the 60s and 70s, the, the traditional heroin um, seller, the pusher, used to care about their yeah. people and they would yeah. cut the heroin with vitamin B. Yeah, because it was it was less harmful. They didn't want to put anything bad into their drug. Right now they're cutting it with PCP, with fentanyl. I mean, we got people Rat that present, poison because yeah. it burns when yeah. it goes up the arm, wow. and that, they think they're getting a good, better yeah. high. Wow. Yeah. We have people that present to treatment facilities now. After all that we talked about, they finally get in and they go give a urine, and they go, "We can't take you because there's no opiates in your urine." And then like, I've been shooting for weeks. What are you talking about? <clears throat> if that presents, if anybody goes to treatment and their urine comes out empty, uh, you know, for opiates, they need to let that person know you need to ask them for a fentanyl test. Yeah. Because you're probably shooting for And fentanyl. we couldn't admit into the methadone program if it was uh, coding. Yeah. I don't know, I don't know if that, that still exists because that, that was considered to not be an admissible yeah. drug. It had to be closely aligned with the heroin with and the heroin. Opiates. And one of the things that happens is that the drug tests, they're specifically designed to pick up, different each strip things. is designed to pick up different chemicals. Fentanyl is not on the list. It's a totally you separate test. You have to request test. fentanyl to oh, get it. Okay. A fentanyl right. test. Again, I'm going to go back and play <laughs> See, devil's really? advocate. <laughs> sure. I'm not in the industry, and I'm, I'm going to transition a little bit. All I know is that there's an addict or you're in recovery. Yeah. If you're not in recovery, you don't want to be in recovery because you can just present. And then I hear this headline a couple of months ago was that they cleaned up the tracks. Uh, so, oh, good, they're getting all these folks nice who don't want to do anything, who don't want to be, they want to be an addict, because I don't know any of this that you're telling me, that they cleaned up the tracks yeah. so they have cleaned up the drug problem. The Gurneys, you're talking about the Gurneys. Gurney Street Gurney Project. Street okay. Project. Yeah. Right, but the headline said they cleaned up yeah, the tracks in didn't. Philadelphia. And they cleaned up Gurney Street. They cleaned oh, up Gurney Street. <laughs> it looks like they napalmed the place. 
There is not a tree or a plant in sight. And, and you saw all of this, so to me, the drug problem's over. I'm, I'm speaking for America who's ignorant, doesn't have any mm -hmm. clue of this. So what did yeah, cleaning up the tracks moved. do? So, and, 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 where, and where we are today. So what happens, what happens is some people got into treatment. Um, the city had allocated some extra spaces for us to get people into treatment. But what happens is there wasn't enough time and treatment slots and funding and anything else to take everybody and help them. So probably 80 or 90 percent of the people that were under there are now scattered throughout They're the North Philadelphia area. Mm -hmm. So like you have K &A. Fifth and Allegheny has a crowd. Fifth, um, K and A has a crowd. K and A has a crowd. Um, and Frankfurt and Allegheny has a crowd. Emerald Street, they call it Emerald City. Emerald City, City they call it. They have it, about yeah. 35, 40 people. If you go there on a Friday, the trash trucks show up. They came one day with, with, with these huge water trucks from the city with hoses and started hosing everything down and chasing people down like they were rats. You know, it so every around. Friday they force them out. Unfortunately, you know, people leave and then they end up on Aramingo and in Port Richmond and in Bridesburg and then they start complaining and then they go over there and they move them from there and they come back to Emerald and then from there. And it's like they think that eventually you're going to push them away and one day they're going to magically disappear. Now, I will say, and this goes to DBHHIDS story, <laughs> uh, I do know based on my work with the, on the commission is that I do know that Jefferson Episcopal and maybe one other facility, I can't remember. They're setting up these warm hand kind hand of. Off. Uh, warm hand, hand off. The warm so, hand so, off. And these are hospitals you're speaking of, right? Yes. Jefferson Where Hospital. They're supposed and... to take them off of the street warm hand them over to a facility and then watch them through. But it's difficult to do because, you know, the, the warm hand lasts only a cert, certain amount of time and then they walk off because they... Well, you have, but you, you also have to look at the fact that, you know, like for instance, we'll come in on, on um, CBH and BHSI, who are the two entities that help people get into treatment, are in our, in our facility three days a week, yeah. Tuesday, Wednesdays, and Thursdays. Doing, you know, they assess people, they send them they, their recommendations. But when they're not around and we call them and we say, and they go, oh, yeah, send them to Kensington or Episcopal. They're from the air bridge or they're through the warm handoff. The person gets there. If the person that's working doesn't yeah. know that, then they deny them entry, even though there's a bed waiting for this person because there's just disconnect some days. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, like I too. recently sent somebody to Kensington through CBH and there was this issue where the person got there and they go, well, we don't have anybody working today to do assessments. And it was like, okay, so how are people supposed to get in treatment if nobody came to work? So then they call back later, and then it's like, okay, so somebody came in, but we already have two people. We're not going to see anybody else after that. I, I also, and that's that also contributes to the that fact does contribute that, to. But I do know that, the, and you know, I hate to keep defending the Department of Behavioral Health no. since I kind of do consulting. You know, <coughs> since I'm on their boards, um, I do know that there is a movement afront uh, to bring proact in. You know, and to bring a lot of these certified peer specialists in to and what's help. Pro with the, Proact is a, a what would you call it? A recovery, a primary volunteer organization of people in recovery. I don't know. There's probably a more technical word you could use for it. They do a lot of community work. They They're actually, 17th yeah, they board. actually have a, a recovery center at 17th and Lehigh. Yeah, and at, and at and, fourth and yeah. and at fourth on fourth and like Arch. Wow. Well, and it's. And look, yeah. there's little things that happen in, behind the scenes and people don't realize. We have a guy from the, from the air bridge, mm -hmm. speaks no English, severe mental health issues. He gets, stranded on, he gets stranded here because the recovery house refused to let him take his antipsychotic meds. He unraveled, went, went ballistic in the place, they threw him out. His parents spent three weeks and all of their money to get here from Puerto Rico, running up and down Kensington looking for him. They, mm -hmm. We finally got him into Gerard. They gave him 30 days. Gerard, Gerard, Medical, no. yes, Gerard, Gerard. Medical Center at, at, at 8th and Gerard. They gave him 30 days. They approved him for 30 days. Three days in, he starts to feel sick. He had some type of infection in his liver. They send him to Hahnemann. Hospital. Yes, Hahnemann Hospital. And then what happens is, as a result of him having to go to Hahnemann as a med for medical reasons, he lost. he lost the bed. He now has to be reassessed mm. to determine whether or not he can come back because his level of care changed. So traditionally, what used to happen was a hospital couldn't release you unless you had a secure place to go. Now what they do is they hand you a piece of paper with some recovery houses on it, and they go, yeah, this is a list of recovery houses. You need to figure out what you can get into. Have it's a good on day. Your own. On, the, on the chart, it reads, sent to a recovery house. Right. But realistically, the person was put out on the street 
They're not from Philadelphia. They don't speak English. They have no transportation, no job, no communication skills, mentally ill. Probably doesn't have a cell phone. Doesn't have a cell phone. No. Pay phones are non-existent, but you have yeah. to have money to use them. And, and this is and this is this traditionally happens because the minute that somebody gets ill, which is you you for me I don't know, call me crazy, but you should plan for somebody who's coming off the streets addicted to come in for treatment that they're possibly going to have some medical health issues. Just coming in off the street. Just coming yeah. in. Just just without even the the, the drug addiction, but just yeah, coming that, in. Yeah, that off should the be street. a consideration. So when this person presents, if they get sick, it's like okay, we're going to take care of you. If your level ch of ch of care changes, we've planned for it. Because now this person is back where they started from. Well, actually, you're going to give you a physical when you come in yes. to see what your medical needs are because maybe you have high blood pressure, maybe you have diabetes. Who knows what you're presenting yes. with because who knows yeah. the last time you yes. saw a doctor? Well, uh, and this is I, one I of know the biggest we can issues. go on with this conversation yeah. for about five hours. <laughs> yeah. But what I want to make sure before we end this, and we have about 10 or 12 minutes, I okay. want you really to spend some time talking to us about the Narcan process. So. So let me say this, in the, what we were talking about earlier, and in the, in the display that, I, that, that people are gonna see, there is three vials and you have heroin, the amount of heroin that it takes to, to kill a human being, the amount of fentanyl that it takes to kill a human being, and the amount of car fentanyl that it takes to kill a human being. Car fentanyl is an elephant anesthesia that is 10,000 times stronger than heroin. Mm. That's cut with into the... This is being sold like that. Oh. They're cutting it. So what they did at one point was cut heroin with fentanyl. Okay. Then they started cutting the fentanyl with heroin, and then they just started selling the fentanyl. See, what happens is heroin, like I said, is 92 to 96% pure. It'll run you between eighty dollars to $100,000 to buy a kilo of heroin. Mm -hmm. Fentanyl, which is 100 times stronger, is ten to 15000 So you have something that's potentially 100 times stronger, 80 to 85 to 90% cheaper. And you can cheaper. then spread it. And then the, some, some intelligent person decided, oh, I can make a million dollars off of one kilo where it would take me several kilos of heroin to, right. to be able to make and the same amount of money. To get than the but they're killing people because they're selling this amount of fentanyl and car fentanyl in this amount, in the amount of heroin mm. that presents itself. Keep in mind that between fentanyl and car fentanyl, there are 40 other fentanyls, all different grades. Also, this is the, and the reason that I talk about car fentanyl, this is the problem that Ohio is having. They expect 10,000 deaths this year in Ohio. Mm -hmm. Their problem has become so, so bad that the medical examiner's office in their city hospital had to put refrigerated trucks in the parking lot to keep up with the bodies that are coming in because they can't keep up with them inside. Wow. Mm -hmm. Now, <laughs> traditionally, what, what unfortunately happens is that somebody will present to buy heroin and get sold fentanyl and not know it. There is a difference in the overdoses. Heroin overdose is just that. You see somebody, a heroin intoxication is that person that looks like they're gonna fall down, and they don't. They nod and they nod. There's a nodding. Yeah, yeah and nod, eventually nodding. that person may go and sit somewhere, and their breathing will gradually slow to the point where it comes to a stop, and they stop breathing and they went into their overdose. With fentanyl, the minute that it touches the bloodstream, they seize up, they go rigid, their jaw locks up, and it presents itself like a, like a grandma seizure. So we've come on the scene of an overdose and their friends are like, no, no, they're okay, they're just having a seizure. No. Mm. It's an overdose. But most people don't realize it because they don't expect that to happen. Where, what, what so traditionally, let's say you go to, you go to, a, um, to a doctor and you're gonna have a surgical, uh, a, a surgical procedure. They make you two appointments. The day of the surgery and the pre-surgery. And the pre-surgery, they determine whether or not you can still get it and how much uh, fentanyl is gonna take to knock you out. They administer it, they put it into your IV, they'll tell you you're gonna feel woozy, when, and they say to you, mm -hmm. you know, count back from 100, and you get to 99 and you're out. Right. Because the minute that it touches the bloodstream, boom, you're out. In that process though, because it's medically monitored and you have oxygen and everything else on, a chemical called norfentanyl was produced within the body. Out on the streets, 60% of people that have died of fentanyl poisoning did not have norfentanyl in their system which leads everybody to believe they died within the first two to three minutes of having consumed the drug and the body never had a chance to process it. Process it. Yeah. it because, normally would do it as a defensive kind uh, yeah, of... As a, yeah, because you had an appropriate amount. Right. But because this amount is too strong... Overwhelming. Yeah. The, the lung seizes, the person instantly stops breathing and they come, collapse. Wow. It's almost like having a, what they call a marionette? The little puppets? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's like having a marionette and then letting it go. The person just literally drops. There is no, I don't feel well. There is no, let me put my hands out. 
They just literally, like somebody turned the light switch off and the person goes down. If they're injecting, it's instant. It's not uncommon to find somebody with a needle still stuck in their neck or their arm, oh, yeah, still three quarters full. If they snorted it, it takes roughly around two blocks of walking before it finally kicks in and they shut down and collapse. Their lung will seize, the person will instantly stop breathing and they will go into that stiffness because their body is seizing because they can't get oxygen. You call 911 immediately, you administer Narcan, you start the rescue breaths. There are different products. And I'm just going to interject here, again, as that person who's not in the industry. Yes. Just reading the headlines. Narcan came in the scene when? Uh, Narcan officially came in the scene. Well, we've been, we've been training in Narcan for over nine years. Right. We had an underground pilot program we were doing. The standing order was signed into law um, August of 2015. It was officially signed by Rachel Levine, who's the state doc. That standing order states that everybody and anybody can now walk into a pharmacy, hand their insurance in, purchase Narcan, which is usually predominantly what's being sold is this. That's the um, inhalant one. This is, yeah, this is the nasal spray. Um, what ends up happening is that the standing order now gives you permission to get it, even if you're going to use it on somebody else. So it doesn't necessarily mean that when you present your insurance, this medication is to use on you because people are fearful that if they present and buy it, that everybody's going to think they're using drugs. It's designed for you to be able to save somebody's life. So you can purchase it even if you're going to use it on other people. And, and that's what I got from it as a consumer, <coughs> just not in the industry. Oh, good. This is something. So if someone's overdosing, we're going to have more lives saved. Yeah. It's a good thing. Somebody did something wonderful, mm -hmm. like closing down the tracks. They're doing all these wonderful things, but yet these addicts continue to yeah. exist. So, and this is why it's also important because while that person is coming back and forth trying to get into treatment, you know, they have access to, to Narcan themselves. So if they happen to overdose while they're waiting to get into treatment, either some, somebody who's with them can save their lives. Right. The other portion of the standing order is the Good Samaritan Law, which states that nobody's going to be arrested or prosecuted for overdosing or for assisting somebody who's overdosing. Which is important because we had a important. problem here at the college where someone OD'd on the street and they were concerned about liability issues. Yeah, and responding. really, I had to tell them this is a good Samaritan law. Yeah, it's, this, it's similar to, to CPR and uh, you know, somebody's right. choking, the same concept. Mm. But this is also, this is what we originally started training with. This is 10 cc's of Narcan. Um, keep in mind, Narcan is the, the name brand, Naloxone is the generic. But um, it has transitioned from this, the paramedics now carry this product which is in... in is, an, is that the injectable? It's in a little box. This is two milligrams. This is, you can use it intranasally or in intramuscular or intravenous. It can so be used all three ways. you can squirt it up your nose. You can or, squirt it up their nose or you can inject it into the person's system because when you put these two together, for, for instance, you push the purple cap off. This is the medication. This is the applicator. You pull the bottom off. These two, in, this two openings insert, screw them together, and it creates almost like a syringe type. You add the atomizer here, which turns this into a nasal spray. Yeah. And it's important to know how to use this one because this is the generic. Some insurance companies will pay for that. Some insurance companies will pay for this. And it's just like if it was a syringe, but you have it, you put it in the nose, you spray half into one nostril, half into the other. Because it's a heavy liquid, you don't want to put it all into one nostril because it could build up and run out. Now, this is all a part of, and I just want to say, uh, you're giving us a little like summary of all yeah, this, this is which is brief, important, yeah. but I, I just want to let the audience know that uh, eventually you'll be coming back on campus to do some training. To do some actual trainings, uh, yes. For uh, students yes. and faculty next semester. Yes. So and, just, and one of the things you talked about earlier, I'm going to let you continue, is about the arm and the, like how the long it takes for each, yes. each to work. So the paramedics, so then if they don't, if they need to rush, because intranasal takes five to eight minutes, they can then put a syringe tip, a 22 gauge, 22, a 22, 23 gauge syringe tip, an inch and a half long, and they'll do intramuscular back of the arm into the thigh, top of the buttocks, which takes three to six minutes to kick in. Or they'll follow the collarbone to the main artery, and they'll go right into the neck, now, which now takes just 30 as, seconds as to a minute. As a non-medical person, which we all are here, right. yes. uh, when I was trained, that that freaked me out because I don't yes. usually inject people. So, uh, so in reality, when the nasal spray came in and made life a whole lot easier. Yes, and this is one of the this is yeah. and this is one of the reasons why this product has become predominantly what people are using. And two of these in a box is about $149 if you pay cash. Um, but your insurance company, especially if you have public assistance, is completely covered. Easy. Peel the back, remove the product. I always tell people remember quote unquote. 
It goes like this, thumb goes here, fingers go here, put it in the person's nose and you press. The minute you press, it discharges instantly, it's a mist. This little stem will fall off. It doesn't offer this because obviously this is a demo, but it'll instantly fall off. It takes five to eight minutes to kick in. Meantime, you call 911, you administer Narcan, you start rescue breath if the person is not breathing. There's a shield that looks like this. And um, you put it over the person's face and you breathe through that white circle to give the person rescue breaths. Two strong and breaths every five seconds. And the reason for that seconds. is to protect you from possible... Yeah, this is to, because people, you know, you never know. You, you're putting your, you don't want to put your lips directly on somebody right. else if it's a stranger. But the, your, the rescue breaths that you're giving, when you blow into somebody's mouth, you're only giving them 16, 17% oxygen. The rest is carbon monoxide. You have to be mindful that that person has a good probability the longer you're doing rescue breaths of throwing up when they wake up. So the minute that somebody starts to breathe, you're gonna know, because overdose presents itself as that rigidness I talked about. Purple, blue, pale with a gurgling noise, the darker the skin of the individual they present is gray or ashy. Once you see that, that person is in distress, you call 911, they are not breathing. Oxygen, rescue breaths. The minute they start breathing, their color's gonna come back. Once that happens, you wanna turn somebody on their side put them in a rescue position. Because of the potential the possibility to and throw up. And the rescue position? Could, is that fetal? Well, the rescue the position is on their side. side when we were trained. And we, way. yeah, and you basically, this arm up, this hand across the chest, if you're on the left-hand side, you're going to tuck the right foot underneath the fold of the left leg behind the knee. Literally, if you're on the left-hand side and you grab their knee and you pull them to you, they'll roll right over. They That's become a weightless. That's protective for really yeah. swallowing their own. They could vomit. choke on their they vomit and asphyxiate. Mm -hmm. If they wake up, you need to let them know because one of the reasons people used to overdose in the, in the, in the past was they thought that this was a complete opiate flush. Yeah, and this is not yeah. a flush. This is a receptor blocker. It just temporarily blocks the opiate receptors. And what would happen is that because this takes 30 to 60 seconds, sends you into instant withdrawal, people would go out seeking more drugs, trying to counter this because they wanted to get rid of the withdrawal. This stays in your system 30 to 90 minutes. When this wears off, whatever your body didn't process during those 30 to 90 minutes, the rest of that drug is gonna come back. The effects are gonna gradually come back. And whatever was happening, if you added more drug on top um, with what caused the overdose initially, now becomes a fatal overdose. Mm. So people who are, who are revived, need to be told, you were given Narcan, do not use for the next two hours. You are temporarily blocked, the drug is still in your system. You could go into a fatal overdose if you use more. If you use one of these to wake somebody up, they're probably gonna feel the effects of the drugs when they wake up. Mm -hmm. If you use more than two or three, that person is probably gonna go back into an overdose once this wears off. Because that means they either have something extremely powerful or large amounts in their system, and it took several doses of Narcan to wake them up, they should go to the hospital. But if they refuse, stay around a populated area because there's a good likelihood that within the next 30 to 90 minutes, they're going to hit the ground again. Mm. And can I just say that <laughs> Alvis is doing great work in the community. Um, he came over to our agency and trained, and it was amazing. He just, it was, you know, Thank wasn't you. as compact as this training. <laughs> yeah. But um, he gave us a thorough training, and he certified us, because um, we're out in the field every day. Sure. Right? And um, so just thank you. Oh, you're welcome. You know, yeah. you thank did you. great work. Well, that's all the time we have for today. I want to thank my co-host, Dr. Renee Nor Norris-Jones, and my two very special guests for being here today. I would also like to thank you, the viewers, for tuning in. You have been watching the Tapestry of Life on CCP-TV, the educational channel of Community College of Philadelphia. I am Dr. Pascal Scholes, Professor of Behavioral Health and Human Services, and Director of the Office of Collegiate Recovery. See you next time. <music>